well, my parents were born in 1929, mm-hmm. so that's a pivotal year, and, and I spent a great deal of time with my grandparents. Sure. And uh, work was the focal point. It was where you develop your worth. It was where you develop your standard of living. It's where you spent the vast majority of your time. And so to um, embrace the concept of just going and having fun mm-hmm. was was not an easy thing. I can remember my grandfather, whom I started working for when I was, gosh, I don't even know, eight or nine years old in the family business, doing whatever an eight or nine year old could do. Right. I would say, okay, uh, it's okay to go to school. I want you to get a great education. It's okay to be involved with organized sports. Yeah, that's a good thing. It's okay to be involved with things like Boy Scouts that are organized. It's okay to go to church. Mm -hmm. You know, important to go to church. But in that other time that's out there, um, you know, you need to be helping the family and the business. And uh, so that that free time that we find so much available to us today, despite the distraction economy, despite everything that's going on, mm-hmm. um, those gaps were filled with helping the family and the business. And so I, I think learning to create moments where you can be uh, in that moment, you know, and enjoy yourself and have fun. That's uh, that's not necessarily something that comes natural. Why do you think people's worth why why do you think there was such a such an insistence on spending that marginal minute on i like that term it's great something that had productive value to society um or that 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 was universally considered to be valuable activities that were considered valuable rather than um rather than fun I think they remembered a time of scarcity. They remembered a time when there was not enough. There was not enough uh, gasoline to put in the car. There was right. not enough uh, money to pay the utility bill. There was not enough food on the table. And that's why you saw them build large pantries. You'd go to homes in those houses in those days, and they'd build big rooms that were pantries because they would, you know, can fruits and vegetables and and. Uh, freezers, these deep freezers in the garage that would hold enough meat for, you know, forever. Right. The idea being that you you might at any time be close to the economic precipice. Yeah, absolutely. That you might at any time um, not be able to, to be stable and to live. It wasn't about prosperity. It was about stability. Mm-hmm. And, and then I think if you flash forward a couple of generations, and, and I'm a baby boomer, and uh, we came up in a generation where we wanted our kids not to have to deal with any of that, mm-hmm. even from their parents or grandparents. We wanted them to have a big, oh, huge safety net underneath them. You know? right. So go and explore. Go take as long as you need to take in college. Go travel around the world. Go do whatever you need to do to find your purpose in life or find your passion in life. And, you know, God be with you as you go to explore those things. So I think that was that was part of what drove it. And uh, I think we wanted our kids to have maybe more fun than many of us allowed ourselves to have. I, I also think work is an addiction. And it's probably the, my favorite term is it's probably the only uh, addiction that's socially acceptable. Uh, if you're that addicted, if, if I was as addicted to a drug as I'm addicted to work, people would rush me off to, you know, Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. Or if I was that di- addicted to food, they'd rush you off to, what is it, the biggest loser or something. But when right. you're addicted to work, society validates it. If you say, I spent this whole weekend preparing to do a podcast, and so I would be really good on this podcast, they'd say, wow, that's great. You're going to do a podcast? You're going to do three more speeches next month? You're going to you know, do this. You're going to, you're going to, you set a goal of reading 50 books for yourself this year. Fantastic. You know, get more. Maybe next year you can do 60. Mm-hmm. And so society validates that. Whereas other addictions, I think society interrupts them and says, whoa, wait a second. That's not a healthy thing to do. So let me push back on that a little bit. Is it now that we're adopting broader definitions of what work is, mm-hmm. is it, is it sometimes good that we, spend that we balance the marginal fun so to speak against the marginal self-improvement the you know 20 years ago this podcast doesn't exist so the idea that you and i can share ideas in a venue like this is there a i i find it very fulfilling to be here um and i it seems like you've you've found the show edifying in in some way as well which we appreciate um 
and we're very glad that you're here, obviously. So is there a degree to which 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, this is actually considered play? And because we're adopting broader definitions of what work can be, right. that something like this is actually a healthy add to what they would have called 50 years ago our actual work time. Yeah, I would have called it recreation. Right. You know, I think it's all about being mindful. Yeah. About understanding where you get uh, passion, where yeah. you derive your passion. Right. right. Um, where you get your, your energy from, you know. And, and um, so how we define work is very different. And, uh, you know, for many years, as you, you know, Ben, I was on the horse ranch. And when I first got into that venture, I did it on one horse and I did it because I liked to ride and it was a great stress relief and right. it was something I adopted much, much later in life, in my 40s. Um, had always had a passion for it, but adopted in my 40s. And it, very quickly, I turned that into work. You know, first I was asked to serve on the board of the National Rating Horse Association. Oh, wow, that's fabulous. You know, I get to go to Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City six times a year and, and serve the industry. You know, and then I was elected to the executive committee. Then I was voted president of the, of the foundation. And before I knew it, my time on the back of a horse was going further and fur getting fur less and less. And my time working on the business was getting more and more. Mm -hmm. So I converted in my mind, um, almost without recognizing that I converted what was started as a passion and a way to relax into work. Until I looked up one day and said, this is, this is wrong. You know, I, I want to I wanna ride horses. I don't want to think about the horse industry. I don't want to ride horses. So. so then what did you do? Stopped it. I think that's the key. I think when um, mindfulness allows us to be self-aware, and mm -hmm. when you become self-aware, and you can you can stop it. You don't have to have mm -hmm. somebody else come in and interrupt it and say, "No, you're you're making that work." And we could turn anything we do into work if we want to. Particularly, someone who's a workaholic can turn anything they do into work if they want to. So uh, I think you just you just become more aware, more self-aware. You see it happening, and you, and you stop it, and you just say, "No, I'm gonna I'm gonna." And I think the other thing is creating more time in your life that's unassigned. Yes. I love unassigned time. Yes. And um, uh, I, I think that's great because you can walk into a weekend or walk into a night at home and just because you don't have it scheduled from, you know, pillar to post, as my mom used to say, yeah. I think it's a fabulous thing. <laughs> from doorway to dungeon. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. People often ask me, uh, now, what are you going to do on Saturday? I don't know. When I wake up Saturday morning, I'll let you know. There's some things I probably have to do, but... You know, I'm going to create some some time, some ability to just be. I worked with a great counselor one one time, and I don't want to digress too much, but I'll tell you a fabulous quick story. Please. Um, her name was Dr. Fran Snepp, and I love her forever. But uh, we had been working together, and I'd hit a really difficult time in my life. And, and I would see Fran on Fridays, and I'd see her on Mondays because weekends had become a challenging time for me. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. And uh, I came in one, we finished working together one Friday, and she said, Hey, Bill, this weekend, just be. Hmm. I said, Be, I'm Franny, what do you mean? She said, don't call me Franny, Dr. Snap. You know, <laughs> just be. And I said, I don't know what you mean. She, she said, Bill, you'll figure it out. So I'm driving home, I'm driving through beautiful neighborhood in Charlotte and going to my house and then pull up and thinking, what am I going to do to be? So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up in the morning and put the top down on my convertible, and I'm going to drive up in the mountains. To, uh, that's a perfect place to be. The nice part about Charlotte is in about an hour and a half, you can be in the mountains. Right. About an hour and a half, you can be at the beach. Yeah. Either way. So I decided I was going to go up to the, to the mountains. So I drove up to the mountains, got up to a little village there I love called Blowing Rock. And I was walking around a little bit. There's a nice little square in the city. So I did a little shopping. I grabbed a, uh, I grabbed a box lunch, and I sat in the park. And I'm sitting there and saying, man, I don't think I'm being yet. I just don't. This isn't, this isn't working. Maybe I need to go over to Grandfather Mountain and climb up on Grandfather Mountain and look out. That Certainly I can be when I get on Grandfather Mountain. So I go over and swap out my city shoes for my hiking boots. And I Walk instead of driving to the to the tip of the mountain, I walked up ways and there's a suspension bridge you can go across. You get out to this outermost point. So I'm looking out over this beautiful valley and I'm sitting there and I'm going, man, I don't I don't think I'm being yet. So I'm getting frustrated trying to be trying to work it 
And uh, uh-huh. so I get back in my car and I'm driving down the mountain. And I see one of those little areas where you pull over and there's a concrete uh, picnic table. You've seen a million of them. Yeah. So I decide I'm going to sit on top of that picnic table. And I, have, I was reading a book, uh, The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. A little great interesting, book. interesting book, interesting trilogy. Yeah. Great book. So for some reason, I climbed up on the top of that that table, and I'm sitting up, and I'm reading this book, and I'm reading, and I'm reading. It finally gets too dark to where I can't read anymore. And I had this unbelievable peace that came over me. Now, believe me, when you're reading that book and you've got some peace that comes over you, <laughs> there's a bit of a dichotomy <laughs> No question there. Um, and I thought about it. I said, I think I know what Franny's talking about. I think I know that I've just realized how to be. I was in that moment. It's completely in the moment. So I go in the next Monday, the next day, to chat with her and to tell her what I had discovered. And she said, yeah, Bill, that's right. That's, that's just being, now I need to get you where you can do that in your office, in your home, in the airport terminal, where you can find that moment where you're at absolute mindfulness and peace and you can enjoy it. Whether that moment is an hour or two like you had in, in, in the park or whether it's 10 minutes that you've got in your car in traffic or you've got in your office and you just got to find that ability. So I've kind of been on that journey to find those moments whenever I can and to allow to allow myself to be. It's giving yourself permission, Ben, more than anything is to allow yourself to be. What was the difference between when you found when you kind of grabbed it when you found how to be so to speak and earlier in that day were you trying too hard earlier in the day or what was it that kept you from achieving that kind of little nirvana so to speak well i was turning it into work i was Uh, on the just be work trip i see okay so i had mapped out that morning where i'm gonna go how soon i'm gonna get there what i'm where i'm gonna park what i'm gonna do when i get there where i'm gonna have lunch you know, I'd scheduled it out. Pro- I'm surprised I didn't put it in Outlook. You know, <laughs> I mean, it just I, I, I was working the concept. Of and being. when I got to absolute frustration and exas- exacerbation about that, you know, when I just got to the end of my rope and I finally pulled off to the side of the road and I sat on that concrete table and just dove into that book. And I'm not a big fiction reader. That's the thing that's ironic about this. I'm more of a, of a nonfiction reader. Uh, and I dove into that book and 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 just lost, completely lost myself in it and lost track of time. Let me posit a theory for you. Mm-hmm. You were doing something that had zero to little, maybe a little, um, but very little redeeming social value. It was yeah. something that was just what you chose in that moment. It was not something that you were doing with an eye toward, well, if I do this, then, then I could do that later. Then I could discuss this book with people or there's, there's some sort of outside merit to reading this particular book or sitting in this park at this moment. This park is a significant thing in some way, a significant place. It was just what you wanted to be doing and there was no there was no outside influence on the activity that you chose in that moment does that make sense well absolutely and i'm an active reader so i read with a highlighter and a pen (laughs) and little sticky tabs and all kinds of things and even if i'm reading a novel i'm writing on the inside of the cover the characters and who they are and so if i come back to it to reread it and it's so I'm an active reader. Well, here I had no highlighters. I had no pens. I had no That's anything. And the book was a gift from a special friend who asked me, she said, if you'll just get to page 98, you'll you'll absolutely love the book. But you got to get to page 98. And I was sitting there like, what is so magical in the first 90 some odd pages of the book? But she was right. You had to work your if you read the book, you have to work your way through. Uh, his writing style and through the words and some of the complexities of it. And then you get caught up in the story. And it was the only book that I remember, and I'm a pretty big reader, that where I would wake up in the morning before work and read a little bit. I'd take it to, to work. I'd read a little bit at lunch. Right. I, I just absolutely wanted to get through that story. And it's and it's a dark story, so I'm not trying to make make anyone believe it's, it's pleasant. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it was just finding the moment. You know, and um, and now learning how to recreate those moments and they don't have to be long. Sometimes uh, a special five minutes in your car waiting at a stoplight when you could be frustrated with the traffic 
and being able to find that time and just use it is uh, is good because we're in an over communicated society. We don't have to talk about that. You know, that's just everywhere we look and turn, we've got a screen in front of us or something going on where we're over communicated. So finding a way to sort of quiet that, quiet your mind, quiet yourself and allow yourself to, to just be is kind of special. In your mind, something you said earlier piqued my curiosity. You said it's easy for us to turn anything into work, especially for a person who is a workaholic. To In your mind, what is just this side of being a workaholic and what is, what's the last step before and the first step after? I think if you're obsessed with what you're doing to the point that it dictates your life, that yeah. the, the, the to-do list keeps getting longer and longer, the, yeah. the commitments keep getting greater and greater, uh, then I think you're you're on the wrong side of that of that tipping point. Um, when when you're pretty much your element of choice is eliminated, and and probably you eliminated it yourself. To be very honest with true with you, Ben. I mean, but but once you, when you're to the point where you've eliminated choice, and you look up and there's never enough time to do what you perceive you need to do, or that you know I'm, I'm, I love to say that um, you know excellent is the enemy of good enough. You know, so uh, I, I, sometimes it's good enough to just do so much or just to stop at some point. And um, you can be a perfectionist. I think perfectionism plays into this a little bit. And you just keep grinding on it and working on it. And, mm-hmm. and to, at some point, you have to stop, stop everything. And say It's good enough. It's OK. Yeah. So I, I don't know what the exact tipping point is, but I think what, to me, it's control. It's control of your time. I think your time is the most valuable resource that we have. And when you give up control of your time and deference to anything, whether it's work or anything, and you don't have any time to invest in yourself, you don't have any of those magic moments, you don't have any, then I think you're, you're, uh, you're teetering on being a workaholic. We welcome Bill Peel to the show. <laughs> <laughs> we got into that sort of through the back door, didn't we? What is your favorite superpower? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I would love for my superpower to be teleportation, which uh-huh. means that I can sort of instantly go to where my mind takes me. I've got a very fertile, active mind, and I would like to way. be able to blink and be wherever I needed to be at the time and observe and be a part of it. So that'd be a wonderful superpower to have. I'm afraid I might abuse it, but it'd be a wonderful <laughs> superpower to have. What's the, fr- if right now, first place you would go? Paris. Paris. Paris, never been. It's on my bucket list. Need to go. Want to go. Have to go. Need need to allow myself to go. Yeah. You, how would you activate the power? You said blink, but you don't mean like a literal blink, or do you mean a literal blink? I mean blink? a literal blink. Ah. I'd love to blink and be there. Yeah. Be in the moment. Nice. Yeah. Now, if you have, I think if you've got an active mind, I'm somewhat of a creative, and if you've got a creative mind and it's active and you've engaged it. Uh, would it be great to just be able to blink your eyes and be where you are and, and, and enjoy that moment and then blink and be back? Sure. I mean, I'd always, you always want to come home to Aggie Land, right? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> We're going to steal a few questions from a previous guest, Mike Alexander, as we've done on the last couple of shows. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. And uh, I am uh, a first gen. Yeah. Uh, my dad was the youngest of nine children. Yeah. And uh, my grandparents didn't have running water in their house until I was graduating from college, which yeah. will give you, which was you know 1974, class of 74, which will give you a benchmark for um, the lifestyle that that my family got. I didn't grow up in privilege. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to um, to make it to Texas A and M and uh, make it my home. But uh, yeah, Memphis, Memphis in in the 60s, which was a very interesting time to be there, to be, just to say the least. But so where I grew up. How many in your family? Five. I have two younger sisters. Both of them are in um, K through 12 education. One mm-hmm. of them's retired. And the other, and she taught early grades, everything from kindergarten to I think first or second grade. And then my uh, younger sister is in education administration and she works in special ed, SPED, and still very active in the Memphis area. They're both still in the Memphis area. And mom and dad. What was your first job? You, well, as I mentioned to you, I worked in the family business as soon right, as I can yeah. remember. My my grandfather, I like telling this story. My grandfather used to go and get his shirts starched so heavy they were like 
you know, like cardboard, and they would mm-hmm. put a cardboard in the shirt when they folded it, and he would pull them out and save them. And he always told me I had great handwriting, and he'd say, I got all these slogans and signs I want to put around the business. You you, you go and do them, and I'll pay you a quarter a sign. Ah. So I would go and make, you know, a couple of bucks, which was a lot of money back then, hand lettering signs on shirt cardboards for him that he could place all around the, the business. So uh, that was my first kind of work experience. My first real job was I was a sacker in a grocery store yeah. when I was in high school. They don't really have sackers anymore, I don't think. But uh, but that was my job. I worked at a, at a store pretty close to my house and um, I learned a lot of lessons doing that. So when I wasn't sacking, I was stocking the shelves and learning about inventory management and all those kind of things. So, uh, yeah, those were my first pay. I had a variety of jobs. So uh, going through school, I worked in a Canada dry bottling plant. I worked in a lumber yard. I, I did a little bit of everything, whatever it took to, to pay the way. So normally we go quick through these, but, but I want to hear about the lessons. You said you learned a lot of lessons from sacking. Uh, you know, well, you learn about customer service. Yeah. Uh, I, I found that the career sackers, knew the big tippers they Ah. knew the ladies who in those days the ladies would go to the grocery store and they knew the big tippers and so they'd literally shove you out of the way to get to the counter (laughs) when miss jones came up and she was a huge tipper right so you learned uh you know uh survival Mm -hmm. uh you learned but that, that great customer service would uh uh get you opportunities i can remember that um one of the uh, ladies that came and shopped there regularly asked for me one day. She says, well, I want Bill to sack my, my bags because he does it so neatly and he takes them so courteously out to the car. And, uh-huh. and so you learn a lot you about said, customers. Step aside, friends. Yeah. Let Bill this show is you my, how this, this is my customer. Uh, but you learned about that. You learned about uh, the importance of being on time. You mm-hmm. learned about uh, the importance of people relying on you to do your job, even though it seemed like the, mo- the the least important job. When you know when you're sweeping the floors at the end of the night or mopping the floors, and you um, you kind of complaining about it, and you don't understand why. And then the owner comes through and says, "Do you realize that the cleanliness of the store causes business to be here? And if the business is here, that means I can hire you. If I can hire you, you can make a check, paycheck." So you learned a lot about business and finance and marketing and human resources. And you saw people lose their jobs. You saw people that um, made bad decisions and it impacted their lives. So it was a microcosm that at a really young age uh, helped me learn quite a bit. And my grandfather was a great mentor. I mean, he he really um, he taught me a lot about marketing, probably some of the biggest lessons about marketing I learned from him. And when I was a, you know, a tyke, young guy. So it was, yeah, those were great times. What was your greatest challenge as a child? Well, you wouldn't know it today, but I was so skinny. I was a skinny kid all the mm-hmm. way up until probably when I was in college. And I was always teased about being skinny. I wanted to play all the sports. I wanted to play basketball, football, baseball, all of it. And I just didn't have the physique to do it. So um, that was a little bit of frustration. And then, and then kind of anecdotally, another thing was I've got an unusual name, Bill Peel. And people would either call me Orange Peel or Banana Peel oh, yeah. or, or, or they'd ring rhyme it and they'd say Bill Peel. And it frustrated me for so long. I mean, probably into adulthood, it frustrated me. I mean, why, you know, why am I saddled? Why did my mother saddle me with this, this name, which, by the way, I'm a junior, so my, my dad had the same name. But... Uh, then at some point, a, a, a sort of a light turned on, and I said, you know what? People remember that name. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you know, it a, a common name. name. Right. And so I decided I was going to turn it to my advantage and use it to my advantage. And gosh, it's it's been a, an asset ever since then. But when you're a kid and, and you're sensitive about everything, you know, uh, it was, it was, you got teased a lot. So you know, those, those were things that occurred. You get through it. I got teased a lot when I was a kid too. Maybe does does every kid get teased a lot? I think guys. And I went to an all boys, almost like a prep school, yeah. and and it was a rite of passage yeah. to get teased by the guys, you know. And it was just you know, it was True. pretty bad in your freshman year. It got a little less in your sophomore year, and by the time you're a junior or senior, you found a way to work your way through it. But boy, in those first few years, it was. Uh, and those are the adolescent years, you know, when you're concerned about everything. It was it was pretty interesting. Sure. What did I can't and, imagine you getting teased about anything, Ben? Phew, man, I got it bad when I was a kid. I was skinny too, <laughs> uh, and I don't know. I was just I was 
I was, my, my dad told me when I was in first grade, I think he said that key to having friends is to be nice to everybody. So I was nice, but, um, but I was just, I was a weird kid. Like I was thinking about weird stuff. Um, and, uh, and honestly, some of the impetus for this show, these two have heard this before, I think, but is, and you know, the discussions that I lead on Facebook, there the 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 reason for all of that i think at some level is still the two-year-old standing in his yard watching the kids play across the street sure and wondering why none of them wanted to play with me sure and wishing that they would come play with me and pick so, you first for the team yeah man that would have been the day yeah so so you know like growing up and you know i'm fortunate to have a lot of friends now and um that's i'm grateful for that every day and i think one of the reasons that i appreciate it so much is because i know what it's like not to have that yeah. i remember it in the deepest corners of my soul and so being here and having people who want to come every week to come talk to me about stuff and tell me about their lives. Yeah. There's nothing better than that. Yeah. It's somebody, I read somewhere that uh, we remember about five absolute pain incidents in our lives that stay yeah. with us forever. Yeah. And I thought about it. I said, you know, there are, I, I can remember two or three of those that have stuck with me for forever, you know, that sure. today probably don't mean that much, but, but those do stick in our minds and they define us in some way, you know? So, uh, yeah, the, but those adolescent years are, are challenging. Yeah. Give us 60 seconds on how you got here to your current position. Um, it was, it was interesting. I had made the decision many years ago that, um, Aggie land would be my forever home. I love Texas a and I loved it from the first moment I got here. And I thought when, when I get to a point where, I'm not working that A&M and College Station, Bryan College Station would be my my home, my forever home. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to make that happen in 2016. I bought a house here, even though I was still working in Houston and um, renovated it and was spending quite a bit of time here. And then early in 2017, I had an opportunity to uh, retire early from the company that I was working for and uh, Telepson Corporation, great company. And so I moved here in the spring of 2017. And towards the, I guess, July, August of 2017, um, a dear friend of mine, a, my one of my greatest friends, uh, Brandon Coleman, who's an outstanding alumnus of Mays Business School, mm -hmm. called me one afternoon and he said, what are you doing? Uh, and I said, I'm just hanging around the house. He said, well, throw on some clothes and come over and meet me and, and Dean Eli Jones. I want to chat a little bit. So they were out at the Stella. So I threw on some clothes, ran out and sat down. They were just sitting down to have a glass of iced tea. And, and Shouts um, to the Stella, by the way. Shout out to the Stella. Yeah. And, um, uh, we sat down and started talking. They were describing a process that Dean had been going through to find someone to fill the position that I'm currently in. And, and, and it had had basically uh, declared it a fail search. Mm. And uh, Brandon was serving on the dean's advisory board, and they were chatting about it. And Brandon said, well, you know, a guy that might be good for the job just moved here. And I had met Eli a couple of times before in uh, other university-wide uh, events and really liked him. But we didn't know each other by any, you know, by any shape or fashion. So we sat there and talked, and he painted the picture of what he wanted this position to do. And the more he talked and the more I listened to it, the more interesting it got to me. Because he was talking about innovation, and obviously that piqued my interest. And he was talking about strategic planning. And I had done a lot of strategic planning in my career. And then he sort of said that the expectations he had around the position that he wanted to activate this strategic plan that he had put in place. I hadn't seen the plan at, at that point. And so um, he asked me if I'd just go home and think about it and decide whether it was something I was interested in. So I went home and I sat down and I wrote him an email and told him that I thought that I definitely was interested and there were a handful of reasons why I thought I was well suited for the position. So he reopened the, the search and um, uh, it was interesting because I'd never been through that kind of a search before. So if you ever compete for a job with the university, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting process. And so I went, we went through the competitive process and there were applicants and interviews and interviews and more interviews. And, 
And uh, make a long story short, in December of, of that year, he called and said, hey, Bill, we'd like to offer you the position. So I started in January of 2018. And it's been a, it's been great. I, I would have never imagined starting a new career at this point in my life, nor being as excited about it as, as I've been able to be. So it's, it's a, it's a great story. When you emailed him and you said you were interested in the job for a lot of reasons. Yeah. What was, what was the biggest one? I, I'm a person of faith and I knew it had been on my heart and on my mind that God wanted me to be in College Station, Texas, and at this point in my life, it's a great place. I didn't know why, huh. you know, and, and, and I, I really didn't ask why. I said, yeah, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. Kids were grown. They were off doing their thing. I was single at the time. Yeah. And um, I said, you know, okay, I'll go on faith. Well, I, I really, truly believe that God revealed that through Eli and that this job was here waiting for me to mm. do. And um, uh, it created a really strong sense of purpose as to what I was supposed to do with this, this portion of my career and this portion of my life. So I think that that was the first thing. And I was uh, totally transparent about the sharing that with him, um, which sometimes with your faith, that's, that's a, you know, that's a, that can be a double-edged sword. But, uh, but I felt like sure that uh, I had to be candid. And then I, I actually went through some of the attributes that he said he was looking for. He's looking for someone who uh, could represent the college well, someone who knew how to do visioning and facilitation and create alignment across groups. It, the plan had been developed, and Shannon was a part of it. It had been developed with, with a very inclusive process led by Mary Leah McAnally, who's just fabulous. Yes. And um, so I had a great roadmap to follow. And... Uh, it was just, uh, it, it just resonated. It just made sense. So I just kind of ran down the things I thought that I brought to the position and told them I totally open to the selection process and, you know, bring it on. Love to compete. So it just, it worked out fine. Sounds like it's it. got a happy ending so far. Yeah. You have a special place in your heart for your involvement with the nonprofit Boy Scouts of America. Why is, why is that so important to you? And um, we'll talk about the Eagle Scout achievement momentarily. Well, uh, I started in scouting when I was six years old. Yeah. And our, our church in Memphis was a hub of everything we did. Yeah. And whether it was playing sports or whether it was being a part of youth programs or whether it was part of camp. And the church sponsored the Cub Scout Pack and the Boy Scout Troop and the Explorer Post. All, mm -hmm. You know, Cub Scout Pack 93. Yeah. And so I started with Cub Scouts. My mom was a loyal 50s wife mom who got their kids involved in everything that they could. And she would drive me to my den meetings. And I loved it. I loved the, uh, the achievement, the rank, the learning leadership, building character, the crafts. I was kind of an arts-oriented kid, so there were all, all kinds of crafts to do. Right. And camping and the outdoor activities. And so it was just natural to work my way up through the ranks. And uh, I had high-achiever parents, and they were like, if you're going to be in this, you're going to become an eagle. You know, you're not just going to be in it and participate. You know, you're going to be in it and, and achieve what you can achieve. And so I... Um, I literally spent from six years old until the time I left for college involved in some scouting program. And uh, it was my social group. You know, the same same guys that I was in scouting with were guys I played sports with. There were guys I went to church with. There were guys I went to camp with. And so we all just kind of tugged each other along. There was about a half a dozen of us who were a similar age, and we just kind of tugged each other along. And it was it was the way we lived our life, you know. And and it was neat in those days. There wasn't the comp the competitive nature for a kid's time that you have today. You know, the baseball coaches would work with the Boy Scout leaders to make sure that the kids could go to summer camp and it wouldn't compete with a baseball tournament. Today, the kids are so, you know, you have to make choices. If you're going to play baseball, competitive baseball, you you know, you're basically locked down. Or if you're going to do some other activities, and there's so many, you're raising children now, I think, it, there's so many that um, you have to declare your, your time. Well, back there, back in those days, people all kind of worked together towards one common good. So you got to work it all in. And uh, it was just a cool, neat part of my life. So that's one. I've grown up with it. 
Uh, the other is, I just believe that what scouting stands for, whether it's the scout oath or scout laws, are as sound today as they were when Lord Baden-Powell first crafted them 110 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, you know, I, I can't believe that any parent, if, if their child is so motivated, if their young person is so motivated, and you probably know now it's both young boys and young girls, um, when you start talking about honor and doing your best and and God and country and and helping other people. And, you know, those are just good, sound values and learning leadership skills and learning, um, you know, building character and building a moral compass. Those are, I think, just very positive things. Uh, I once heard Rex Tillerson, who's an Eagle Scout, uh, speak about, um, you know, former chairman of ExxonMobil and Secretary of State, speak about the greatest lessons he learned in leadership he learned in scouting. And I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so I just I just think it instills great values. And it's not for everybody. It's not for every kid. It's not for every family. But those who get involved, uh, we see great, great results. And I'm extremely committed to the underserved. Uh, for example, I'm involved with the Sam Houston Area Council. And uh, we reach only about a f- maybe 10 percent of the kids in the council's geographic footprint that could be reached. And so until we give all those kids an opportunity, whether they choose it or not, until they have an opportunity and they know they can be a part of the program and it's fully funded for them to participate if they want to, then we haven't we haven't reached our, uh, you know, our deal. So uh, but I am stepping down. It was a big decision, but I just told the the, uh, scout executive that I'm stepping down in September. So it'll be the first time I haven't been on the board or the executive committee in a long time. But it's. It's time to interrupt that flow and make myself available to do other things. But it's, it's a beautiful organization. I really love it. Before we close that out, why is, uh, Eagle Scout, we, I know it's a big deal to be an Eagle Scout. Why, why is it a big deal? What, what do you do to achieve that rank? And why does this you know, kind of stand the test of time? Well, uh, statistically, less than 4% of anyone involved, all kids involved in scouting, and to, to this point, all boys, achieve the Eagle Scout rank. And I love to tell the story. I've got a shadow box in my library. And for many years, it sat in my office. It hung in my office. Mm -hmm. And I'd have people, even when I was in a public company, a C-level person, executive in a public company, people would go in and they'd walk to that box and they'd tap on the glass and they'd go something like life or star. And you'd look at it and they'd say, you know, I made it to life and I didn't finish. Mm-hmm. Girls and gasoline got in the way, and I didn't. I didn't finish. That's a favorite saying in scouting. Girls and gasoline pop up, and the boys get distracted, and they don't. <laughs> and they don't finish. So um, I think that the elite nature of it is is very important. Um, I, the, the The journey that you go on, it's not the number of merit badges. It's the, the the development you experience as you go through that. When you today, when the kids take on their scout project and they're giving back to the community, those are all just really positive vibes. And um, I'm goal oriented. So to me, it was uh, it, it was like something that um, I was going to achieve. And it wasn't easy for me. As I said, I was a skinny kid. So like getting life-saving, I thought I was going to drown trying to get life-saving merit badge <laughs> because I was a skinny kid trying to haul this, uh, you know, drag this much heavier, much larger kid out of the out of the water uh, trying to learn life-saving. But, you know, you just you just do it. You just get in there and do it. So it, it was it was and is important to me. And I'm amazed at people that I meet now that are eagles that uh, there's a common bond there of the, of the journey that you've gone on. So it's, yeah, it's a distinction. I'm so glad I got it done. Yeah. Being a goal oriented person on your blog, you have a tab categorized as winning. This tab includes 27 bullet points that you use to coach teams. First, why, why did you choose the title winning? Well, why did you go to the blog? That's that's the big question. Yeah, the blog is interesting, but I'll just digress for a second. Uh, Sean Jasperson, who I just love working with here, and a great colleague, um, showed me his blog, and it's it's wonderful. And I said, man, I'd love to do that. I'd love to just sort of brain drain and get the things out of my head that have been in my head. So he helped me figure out the mechanics of setting up the blog and doing it. And um, I just began writing, and... Um, I have worked with teams to coach them on winning in business for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I developed um, 
sayings, beliefs, strategies, and I keep getting asked all the time, where's the list? You know, where's oh. the where are the peelisms? Where are all these things that we've heard over the years that we um, you know, we want to see? And I thought, well, maybe the best way to do it is to write a blog post about those. And I but to get them out of my head, I put this list together called winning. And I just put them in there and in no priority order yet. And um, I thought one day, you know, they'll uh, I'll get one written on on each one and it'll kind of brain drain. Plus, it'll also be sort of something interesting for my kids to read later in life and learn what I believed in and what was important to me. Twenty seven is way too long, but we'll try to pare it down. But you got to that blog early. It was just just literally um, been up and running. It's it's funny you say twenty seven's a lot. Uh, it's as I was looking at the list, I found myself with some of the same questions that I have when I look at like a John Maxwell list or something like. And by the way, kudos to John Maxwell for being able to think of list after list after list of yep. the thirty four thousand six hundred and twenty one inexorable laws of le- it's it's a different right. word every time. But um, but on that note. In the MBA program, uh, Professor John Krychek talked with us about MBA speak and how to avoid using fancy words to say things that end up sounding pretty vague. 27 things is a lot of things to focus on. What Once you have a chance to elaborate on those points a little bit what will you what what do you do to make those points specific and actionable well um first uh professor krachek is brilliant and you know he is a true talent in communication and teaching communication so he's spot on you can't you've got to keep it simple and keep keep the words few and right and easily understood um I think that the the best way is as I digest and work my way through it is sort of connect them to stories, yeah. Because you, know, uh, you know, facts tell and stories sell, mm-hmm. and so I think just putting That's those good. stories in there and trying to tie some things back to stories and um, th- that makes them resonate more with people. And there's probably some combinations in there that need to be pulled together into stories and. And, uh, you know, it becomes a little more meaningful. I, I never really truly, when I started a blog, I never really truly thought of it being in the public domain. You know, even though it, it's BillPeel.com, it was not intended for that. It was intended to sort of get all these things out of my head. And also, in some ways, to if someone started asking me, well, what about this, this, or this? And I say, well, go to the blog and read blog posts, such, you know, whatever it is. But um, it's beginning to become a uh, gain of life its own. So it's a, it's become a hobby. It's been kind of fun. As you know, we had Bailey Urban on the show and she talked a bit about the book club. She started here for Mays. She listed Simon and I always get this name wrong. It's Simon Sinek. Yeah. Sinek, Simon Sinek. Sinek and yeah. Brene Brown. Right. Um, both of these authors you list as inspiration on your website. As an avid reader yourself, what are some books that you would highly recommend? I'm going to give you three passages in my life and three books slash authors that are meaningful. You're making my job so easy right now. Okay. Uh, The first is a book that was written in the 80s called Positioning, The Battle for Your Mind. It's by Al Reese and Jack Trout. And uh, my copy is so dog-eared and yellowed and, you know, it's almost embarrassing. But um, that book resonated with me at the time it was written because I was just beginning to start a career in marketing consulting and this concept of the fifth P positioning, you know, you got the traditional market mix of four P's and the fifth P right. was relatively new. And they wrote in a way that just made a lot of sense to me about how you position a product or a service or a, even a non a not for profit in the marketplace and find your differentiating points. And, and, and so the book just stuck with me, and I've probably given dozens of copies away and recommended it to people. And so that was the first. It sort of was, gave me a foundation of knowledge on, on uh, marketing and how to relate to organizations that were uh, involved in getting involved in their marketing. The second one is a book called Halftime by Bob Buford. You have a copy of it with I you. I have a copy of Halftime with me. And... Um, Halftime was interesting. It was gifted to me in, in the late 90s. I was about 45 years old at the time. Uh-huh. And the premise of the book, without going into depth, I highly recommend it, um, is that 
our life is broken up into a series of passages. And at some point, think of it as like quarters in a basketball game. Yeah. And at some point you hit halftime and it, you decide what your strategy is going to be for the second half. And um, his premise is you make a shift from success to significance. Hmm. And that really caught my eye. I said I had been I'd spent basically the first 20 plus years of my life getting prepared to earn a living. I would spent the next 20 plus years of my life uh, raising a family and being uh, successful in business. And then what was I going to do with what was left? What was I, how was I going to invest that time? Because um, you can become a success junkie, too. And um, I decided that I really wanted to focus on doing things that were significant. And I was going to rebalance my life to put emphasis on things that were as significant. In fact, put more emphasis on things that were significant than things that were driven by success. So I put my family on notice. I put my kids on notice. I put everyone on notice and said, you know, I'm not going to climb that ladder as fast or as far anymore, I'm going to really look towards doing things that are significant. And I began serving on not-for-profit boards and volunteering in the community and taking the skills that I had developed and applying them to the not-for-profit world and other sides of, um, of the world rather than just um, continuously looking at, at success as my primary focus. So that was the spark that created that. And then most recently, I've really gotten turned on by David Brooks' books. And David Brooks is a New York Times uh, best-selling author and writer for the New York Times. And um, I heard him interviewed by Oprah on a podcast and talking about his latest book called Second Mountain. And Second Mountain is much like uh, the theme in Halftime, a little different. And um, I have a funny quirk about reading that I wanted to go back and read his earlier book before I dove into Second Mountain. So uh -huh. I hit the infamous Amazon Prime push button and ordered <laughs> Second Mountain and realized that I had The Road to Character, which was the book before that, already in my library. It had been sitting in my library for probably since almost it came out because it had been recommended to me, but I'd never gotten to it. Right. So I dived into The Road to Character and just loved it. Loved the premise that, that he wrote. And then Second Mountain was a logical follow-up. And it, that book is a lot about his life and some pivot points in his life. If you haven't read it, it's, it's a really good read. He talks a lot about community, how you define your community, um, how you find your passion, how your avocation driven by passion can really um, shape your life and shape that second mountain climb, that first mountain climb being the success climb and the second mountain being the uh, the one that's more tied to your passion and purpose, and so um, God, those are I guess those are the ones I would most highly recommend uh, that have been defining for me in my life. So, halftime, second mountain. What was the title of the first one? Positioning the Positioning. battle for your mind. Reese and Trout. They're both ad men. Madison Avenue ad men. Positioning the battle not to get killed in Overwatch. Well, the key of the the the, the premise of the book is interesting. It really is very interesting today, some many years later, because it was written in the early 80s, that your mind's full of clutter. It's full of messages, uh, and you got to declutter it. And you've got to carve yeah. out a piece of the mind. That's what marketing's all about, is carving out a piece of the mind. Can you imagine what they would think if they were writing that book today? I mean, how much more challenging it would be today to write that story than it was when they wrote it, you know, early 80s. I think the way that you find a place in someone's mind, though, to a degree, is still the same. It's, ah, you, absolutely. The you, principles are the same. Right. You, you Just find, more clutter. Yes. And less attention span. Yeah. Yeah, you, have to, you do have to do it faster. Yeah. Do you have a favorite experience or story from presenting and coaching teams? One that I love to tell, I'm not sure favorite is the right way to put it. I, I worked with Howard Tellepson, who's the chairman of Tellepson Corporation for many years. I started coaching Howard on presentations probably going on 30 years ago. And mm -hmm. um, early on in working together, I developed a value model for them that was tied to four P's, people, process, product, and price. And Boy, they had that model down pat, particularly Howard had it down pat. And he could recite those four Ps and talk about the power quadrant and talk about why their, their company was different and how it created value. And he just had it down pat. And they brought me in. Um, at one point, I wasn't working for the company, but Howard asked me to come in and help them go after a, a very important project to them at the time uh, to redo the student center at the University of Houston's 
main campus. It was a complex project, had a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, in my mind, I decided to introduce four words that started with the letter E instead of four words that started with the letter P and um, completely threw him off his game. They ended up winning the project, but he came back to me much later and he said, Bill, you have to promise me that you'll never, ever get away from P words again and don't throw <laughs> E words at me because I've got the four P words down pat. So that was anecdotally a kind of an interesting story. Another one that I love to tell is that I was the president of an architectural firm in Houston, and we had an opportunity to present for a 20-year vision plan for the University of Texas Health Science Center. It was a great, in the Texas Medical Center, very prestigious planning project, probably one of the most prestigious planning projects in the city at the time. And I had a team that was supposedly, quotation marks, supposedly working on the presentation. So I was going to go down and rehearse them the day before. And when I walked down to the studio, they looked at me and said, we've got creative block. We haven't done anything. I said, what do you mean we haven't done anything? We present tomorrow to the president of the system, to the board members, to the keep it. We have done nothing. Well, we just, we're just stuck. We've got all these ideas on the wall. We've got all this stuff, but we, we don't know what to do with it. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Go grab me some markers, grab a roll of brown paper, roll it out on the board table upstairs, and I'll be there in five minutes. So I went and uh, met them in the room, and I said, okay, start talking to me about all your assumptions and start talking to me about everything you know about this project. So I literally started on the left-hand end of the page and started drawing an idea map. And um, I'm blessed with a good handwriting and ability to cartoon things. And so I just really started cartooning this whole idea map. And I think it ended up being about 10 feet long when we got through it all. And we were writing on it with white pencils and all kinds of things. And they said, so now what are we going to do? Are we going to put our, our presentation together? I said, no, roll it up. That's the presentation. We're going to take it in there tomorrow. We're going to deliver the presentation. So sure enough, the next day we walked in the boardroom and we no binders, no projectors, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And we rolled this sheet out and we tacked it on the wall. And I went to the presentation and I, we handed each person in the room a yellow pencil. And we said, we're going to walk you through our presentation. At any point during the presentation, if anything piques your interest or anything comes to mind, get up there and just write on it, write your notes on it. And so our guys delivered the presentation beautifully, did a great job. Because what they were doing is they were telling about something they'd already been thinking about for weeks. Mm -hmm. right? People literally got up and they marked on it and they circled things and they drew their version of a star or whatever it was. And at the end, they awarded us the project. And the, um, the head of the selection process came to me and said, you only have to make one commitment to me. And I said, "That's what, what is that? He said, shoot a photo of that, that diagram and put it on the cover of the strategic planning report which we did. It ended up being the cover of the report. And the, and, the, and the moral behind the story was it doesn't have to always be slick, but it has to be engaging and it has to get the audience involved. It has to get them up out of their chair. It has to set the emotional hooks. And I knew that we would have something absolutely different. It was done under duress. So don't let me, don't get me wrong. It I mean, sounds we like were, it. We were, you know, we had our back against the wall, but um, Sometimes your best creativity occurs when, you're, when your back's against the wall. So that was a great anecdote. Right. And it was a kinesthetic experience for them. Engaging at the highest well, engaging level. Engaging the sense. I mean, if, they've, if they've got to get up out of their chair, they've got to think about what they're going to do, and they've got to take that pen or pencil and put a note on there. And, nothing, and the fact that it's not perfect, I love that. I mean, that's what I love about diagrams like that. They're not perfect. When we produce them in the computer... And I, I tell the architecture kids this all the time. When those drawings are so perfectly rendered, mm -hmm. then the client is afraid to make a change. They're afraid to, to, to deal with it because they think it's so perfectly, beautifully, right. photorealistically done that sometimes when it's high touch and it's, and it's not so defined that people get a lot more engaged with it. Well, that's brutal. What is your favorite part about your job as executive director of innovation and strategic planning for Mays Business School? Yeah, the, the most exciting part to me is getting to meet as many people as I get to meet at, in the college and get to work with. And um, everyone is engaged with this plan. Everyone has a contribution to make. Everyone has a role to play. So I've, I've enjoyed over the 18 plus months getting to know people um, asking questions, uh, figuring out how to execute this plan in an informed, uh, inclusive manner, which is just 
absolutely critical to the dean in terms of how we execute. And so that's been that's been a very enjoyable part of it. Um, being able to represent Mays at, on, on other university initiatives and particularly in academic innovation and advanced technology has been a real treat. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's um, it's a dream job. It's great because you just get a, a, an absolute um uh, attitude of engagement going every day. And I don't, even though I kind of know what my week's going to be like, I don't ever really truly know because something's going to come up that someone comes in with an, a request or an idea. And so um, I get to move with that as long as we stay within the rubric of the plan. And I try to tie everything we do back to the plan. Uh, no matter what it is, I try to go back and say, where does this fit? What, what initiative, what goal or what goals does it support? Um, I also have the marketing communications and the corporate and alumni relations teams reporting to me, which is a real treat because we get to work on great media and publications and um, events. And uh, it's a thrill to see them work and do what they do. And I'm just truly blessed with great teams there that that, uh, extend the Mays brand and and uh, engage the Mays family. And it's just uh, it's a it's a great opportunity. What's the hardest part of your job? Oh, that's easy. The hardest part of my job has been learning higher education. Ah. Because uh, higher education is an is a institution in and of itself and that speaks in acronyms and abbreviations and terms. And I can remember sitting in meetings and kind of very quietly Googling up a term to make sure I understood what it was or an acronym. And asking just lots and lots of questions. And uh, fortunately, I'm surrounded by folks here that are so willing to help and to share information and, and you know, be supportive that that's, that's been an easy journey. Also, just learning the academic mindset, you know, the academic freedom. And in corporate America, if you say you're going to have a meeting, you expect everyone to be there. And, they, and they're there out of uh, duty. Um, you might say you're going to have a meeting here and people decide that that's not the highest and best use of their time or highest and best priority. And they have the right and the ability to do that. And so um, learning how to enroll people in a process and enroll academic, include folks from academia in the process is there's an art form to it. And um, I'm fortunate that I have a great mentor and coach in, in Dean Jones and he's He's helped me immensely to, to be better at that. But I think it's a journey that will continue forever, just trying to learn uh, the mind of the academic. And I know you grew up in a household with academics, so you, Indeed, you understand that keenly. Rapid fire. What do you consider your most valuable failure? Well, I don't think you've ever truly failed until you've been fired. And I've been fired. Okay. And uh, I, lo- I love to tell that story because uh, – I was in the midst of doing about a billion dollar redevelopment expansion project in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely doing everything right. I mean, there's no question in my mind that we were making very informed decisions. We were doing things well. Okay. Uh, Getting lots of publicity for what we were doing. But? But in the span of a very short time, the two founders of the company, who was a, a couple, passed away within eight months of each other. They were in their 80s. And, um, one day I was uh, I was living in a high rise, um, yeah. not too far from where I worked. And and uh, my wife at the time asked me, she said, I'm trying to download a photograph and I can't get it downloaded. I guess we don't have enough bandwidth here or something. Can you run to the office and download it? So I said, sure. Get in my car, zip to the office and go to put my card key in the in the reader and it wouldn't work. I thought, That's odd. We must have something going on with the card key system. And then I looked at the security guard who was on the inside, who, by the way, reported to me Uh because I was the COO of the company. Yeah. So I knew most of them. He motioned him over. So he came over. I went in and went upstairs, tried to get in my computer, couldn't get in my computer. My password wouldn't work. Uh Uh, Fortunately, I knew my executive assistant's password. So I uh, logged hers in and I got in, boom, immediately. Well, within about five minutes, some Next generation members of the family walked in and said, we made a decision that we're going to go in a different direction and uh, that you don't have a job anymore. And come by in the morning, bring your credit cards and your yeah. all this kind of stuff, and we'll have a check for you and, uh, you know, for a settlement and, you know, thanks. Well, on the surface, it sounds like, okay, you just shift, you go to the next 
passage in your career. Yeah. And uh, you're going to walk away with some amount of money, which is not insignificant. Right. But you don't realize that when you think you've done everything that you could possibly do, you didn't leave anything on the practice field. You did everything right. You were the spokesperson for the company. You were making, negotiating multi-million dollar deals. You were doing, and then all of a sudden somebody walks in and says, you're not needed anymore. We're going to go a different direction. Well, it took me a, a, a many years, a number of years to reconcile in my mind that that was, that I wasn't the failure. That, that, that I'd been fired. You remember? I mean, I don't know. I grew up in an era when you were fired. I don't care what it was. When you were mowing somebody's lawn and they told you, it's, you know, the kid next door can mow it better than you can, you're fired. If you were fired, you were fired. Yeah. And it was awful. Yeah, yeah. And um, so uh, it took me quite a while to reconcile in my mind that um, I, I did everything I knew how to do, I acted with absolute integrity. Um, I, I, you know, I did the best job I knew how to do. And for a variety of reasons that were totally outside my control, I wasn't going to be in that position anymore. So I, I don't think you can really understand failure until you've been on the dark side of it. And you've embraced the fact that if you've done everything you can possibly do and you've acted with integrity and you've and you've enrolled people in your solutions and you've been inclusive, you've done all those things that we know to do as leaders and for whatever reason, the course of action doesn't follow the path you thought it was going to follow. That's not failure. You know, things, things will change. And uh, so I think getting fired is uh, probably the best lesson in failure you can possibly have. Did they ever offer any further explanation? Never. To this ah. day. To this day. And it's interesting because they're, they're um, um, in that particular development, still developing some of the concepts that we came up with, early concepts, and they're evolving it. And um, um, it, it, it doesn't have absolute closure, so you have to create your own closure. I think yeah, when you have when you have feeling. when you have absolute closure, it's easier. But th th we didn't we didn't have absolute closure. But that's okay. Life goes on. Girl, bye. That's yeah. what I had to say to them. That's it. Next, right? If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? Well, you walked in my office the other day. You saw the big portrait on the wall. So yes, I did. I'm a huge Walt Disney fan. Right. I grew up in an era where Walt Disney um, really entertained us. And uh, I have had the pleasure of studying his life and his uh, process of creativity and display thinking and all the many things that he did that I think are just wonderful. So um, to have walked in his shoes at some point when he was – conceptualizing some of the great amusement parks and movies and characters and venues and things that he did and see the way that he did it uh, would be wonderful. I, yeah, I think I shared with you when you were in the office the other day, I think there's like a, like a, some kind of a correlation between Leonardo da Vinci to Walt Disney to Steve Jobs because they all sort of follow the same pattern. They're all Renaissance men. They're all very, very passionate about what they do. You know, Jobs would re reportedly cry in meetings if, the design of the packaging wasn't correct. And, and, you know, Disney would have these absolute, you know, Donnie Brooks with his brother, if they, you know, they couldn't get on the same page and they were basically bankrupt several times. Mm -hmm. And, but this intense passion for what they did and a belief of the, the attention to detail, this meticulous, meticulous attention to detail was just, it just intrigues me. And I, would have loved to have walked in uh, Disney's shoes and seen what, how his mind was operating. You can come sit at his desk sometime if you want to. Yeah. Um, most important piece of business or career advice that our listeners might not have heard before. I mean, when I was a graduate student, I worked for Dr. Chuck McCandless, and it was a great job. I worked in the Office of Vice President of Academic Affairs and got to work on really neat assignments. Probably learned as much during that period as I did during my graduate education. And um, uh, Dr. McCandless used to always say, don't sweat the little things. Uh -huh. I'd come in, there'd be a dean that was going sideways, or somebody was complaining about this, or somebody was complaining about that. And Dr. McCandless would always say, don't, Bill, don't sweat the little things. And um, I had an opportunity to um, take a job and leave mid-semester and take full-time employment, which was important, obviously. And I went to him. I said, Dr. McCandless, I'm going to take this job. And, and uh, you know, I just really appreciate the time I've been able to work with you and Dr. Dick Winerdy and Dr. Haskell Monroe and Dr. John Calhoun, who were all in that office, were great, great academic leaders, administrators. I said, but Dr. McCandless, there's one thing I got to ask you. I said, 
for years, you've told me, the last two years, you've told me, don't sweat the little things. Every time I come in here, I said, Dr. McCandless, are there any big things? Hmm. And he leaned back in his chair and he looked at me and he said, faith, family, friends. Those big things. And the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. And I really think that we lose sight of that sometimes. We make things bigger than they have to be. So I'm not saying don't pay attention to detail. I'm not saying don't do your job. But I think we fret over things sometimes that we don't have to fret over. And um, if we keep faith, family, and friends in, in the forefront of our minds, and we'll take care of the rest of the business. Needs, that needs to happen. A lot of alliteration on the show today. The three E's, the well, four, four, four P's, yeah, I'm four alli- E's. I'm an alliteration person, unfortunately. <laughs> Fondest memory of Tamu? Um, towards the end of my sophomore year, literally the week before classes were going to end, mm-hmm. my father was going to come and pick me up. And um, we were going to go back to Memphis for the summer. And we were going to... Uh, buy a, a junk car and fix it up, and I was going to bring it back to school. It was going to be my first car. My dad loved to tinker with automobiles, one of his favorite things to do. Okay. I just finished classes over in the architecture building, and I was heading, making my way over to the student center, and people kept stopping me and saying, have you called home? Have you called home yet? In those days, there were no cell phones. You know, there was, It wasn't an easy way to call home, and I said, no, you need to call home. When you get to the C, the student center, you need to call home. So I got the student center, got the pay phone, called home, and found that my father had been killed in an airplane crash, 41 years old, a couple months shy of being, uh, excuse me, 42, a couple months shy of being 43. And my world just kind of came to a stop. I I just didn't know what life was going to be like. And my mother was in a deep state of shock. She had no way of, you know, of dealing with it. She had two young girls to raise. I was off at college. So... I made my way to, to Dallas, which wasn't easy at those time, in those days, and it caught a flight, which was challenging to get on an airplane, even though I have never had any fear of flying. I grew up around airplanes, but it was challenging to get on an airplane, fly home, knowing your dad had just been killed in a plane crash. And um, I landed, and, and immediately I was the man of the house at you know 20 years old and was making decisions and was, um, you know, things were happening at rapid fire and it was all over the news. We had reporters out in front of the house and it was just, it was just really emotionally challenging time. We worked our way through it. Everything t- turned out to be as, as best of an outcome as it possibly could, given the horrible circumstances. My dad's actually, or his remains are actually uh, interned at Arlington National Cemetery. So that's kind of a nice uh, thing uh, to go through. But it got towards the end of the summer, and I went to my mom, and I said, oh, let me, let, me, let me go back. When I found out that I had to go to Memphis immediately, I went back to the College of Architecture. I hadn't finished my final projects. I hadn't finished my exams. I hadn't done anything. Right. And several of the professors came to me, and they said, go take care of your family. Remember, family first. Go take care of your family. A&M will be here when you get back. I remember. A&M will be here. Your A&M family will be here when you get back. And so I went home to Memphis, took care of things, went to my mom. I said, Mom, I guess I'm going to have to enroll in Memphis State. It's now called University of Memphis. Memphis State. She said, oh, no. No no way. Your dad and I always wanted you to be an Aggie and to graduate as an Aggie. You're going to go back to school. Hmm. So when I got back to school, my professors allowed me to make up the work, allowed me to get my classwork done, to get my grades turned in so I didn't get incompletes in all those classes. And they said, welcome home. I never will forget. They walked in and they said, welcome home. Hmm. Well, maybe that was the turning point in my mind as to when I decided this was going to be my forever home because the Aggie family reached out and put its arms around me when, when I needed it. You know, I needed someone to reach out and do that. It was a, it was a tough, challenging time. Of course. Um, and um, it's just always felt like home ever since. So that's a, that's a very fond memory. It won't stay with me forever. As it should. As it should. Anyone you would like to send some good bull? Yeah, I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't send good bull to my dear friend, Brandon Coleman. Uh, Brandon and I met in, in the strangest of ways. I, had a, I was a graduate student. I had an apartment in Treehouse Apartments, which are right over here just south of the campus. And 
uh, one day, the, my next door neighbor's music was so loud, I couldn't even concentrate. I think the, the paintings on my wall were rattling or something. So I kind of went next door and banged on the door. And this guy came to the door and I said, hey, uh, I'm Bill Peel. I'm your neighbor. I said, I hate to ask this, but could you turn the music down a little bit? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Hey, I'm, I'm Brandon Coleman. Well, we shook hands and became friends and have been friends now for over 40 years. Uh, up until very recently, we were neighbors in the little community where I live now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brandon and his lovely wife, Carrie, have moved to Dallas. but And they're both, by the way, outstanding alumni of Mace Business School. But our friendship He's still is, banging it on the speakers. Yeah, too. well, I'm two, I made sure I was two houses down from him this time, <laughs> so I didn't have to deal with that. But, um, uh, you know, it's, he's been a great covenant friend. And I think in our lives, uh, Dr. Jim Jackson wrote a great book called Covenant Friendship. And in our lives, we have a handful, a very small handful of covenant friends that you can really go to with anything. You can mm-hmm. listen to them. They can listen to you. Um, I don't care whether it's a business issue, a family issue, a personal issue. And we have we have been extremely close over all these years. And he was the one that gave me a call and said, hey, you need to come meet Eli Jones. He's got an opportunity at Mays Business School, and it, it might be one you're interested in. So lots of good bull out to Brandon Coleman. Bravo. Bill Peel, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to stay up to date on our latest videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications. If you're in a rush or on the road, you can still join us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you want to learn more about us or our guests, please visit our website at maze.tamu.edu slash podcasts. Also, please check out Mays Business School's academic programs. They're the sponsors of our show, and you can find them in the description. Thanks, and gig'em.